Right. Well, Wei, yes, thank sir. you very much for joining me today. I guess we're shooting this partly for the Armory TV, but you know, if you want to use it, Revolution wants to use it, um, I would love to be able to introduce this video to your audience too. Um, thank you. I've never done this before, you know? I've never had to interview someone on video, and so this could be like our Johnny Carson moment, or it could be our Carson Daly moment, <laughs> and uh, I know which one I'd prefer to be, you know? Okay, so today, I really want to talk about your origin story. Because oh. weirdly, okay. despite like all the things that you've done, all the coverage that you provide other people, I don't think very many people actually cover like your origin story. And you know, personally, I don't know your origin story either. So I thought this would be a great chance to like get it on video. Amazing, Mark. Mark, what if we were to exchange origin stories? I guess we could do that. Let's okay, do that. yeah, let's do that. Excellent. Okay. 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 Yeah. Please, you start. Uh, okay. Um, well, I guess I'll start with uh, Revolution. Um, so, Revolution was um, created as a result of my uh, incompetence in writing about sports and sex. Okay. So, I uh, was, uh, my dad was the representative of Singapore to the United Nations, so I grew up in New York. So, I basically thought I would live my entire life in the United States, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, but um, somewhere along the line, you know, I decided I wanted to come back to Singapore. At the time, my only formal training had been working in the film industry, mm -hmm. not the adult film industry, the <laughs> traditional <laughs> film industry. Not that there's anything wrong with the adult film industry, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and it's apparently super lucrative. And, you know, beloved by all. Indeed. Almost all. Indeed. Hmm. Uh, and, and, and so uh, I had moved back to Singapore and I couldn't get a job because there's the film industry at the time was pretty nascent and today I think is still quite small. Mm. Right? Um, so I remember I'd done some writing for my friend Kim Ho, who was at the time the uh, editor of the local newspaper, mm -hmm. which was the Sunday Times, so the Sunday edition of that newspaper. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was going to try to convince him to give me a job in writing, and basically any opportunity that he said that was open, I was just going to say I was an expert in that subject. Right? So I rang him up and he said, oh, it's fortuitous that you're calling me. I actually have opportunities in three subject matters. And I said, what are those subject matters? you know, ready to sort of claim my sort of expertise in each of them. And he said, well, the first one is sports. Um, and so, and I just said, let me stop you right there. I'm, I'm the most athletic person that I know. I, I love sports. I, I'm about to go play several sports in the you know, near <laughs> This afternoon, in fact, yes. Precisely, uh, <laughs> yes, I imminently. Um, and he said, uh, okay. Right? And, then, <laughs> and then, then he, I said, well, what's the next subject matter? And he said, you know, Singapore, um, they made a tactical mistake uh, when they declared independence and in that they tried to encourage people to have only two children. Mm. As a result, uh, we have a diminishing uh, population and so we need stories on sex so people will have more sex, hopefully unprotected sex, and as a result, we'll have more children. And I said, this is a remarkable coincidence. Because, uh, <laughs> I love sex, uh, I'm, the, uh, I'm the master of all sex, and in a few minutes, uh, I'm uh, got to have sex with myself. <laughs> and then he said, oh, okay. Uh, and, and then finally, I said, well, out of curiosity, you mentioned three subject matters, so what's the third one? He said, well, you know, you may not be aware of this, but Singapore is one of the biggest markets in the world for watches. And that's despite our relatively small um, size, both in terms of population and obviously in terms of geography. Um, Actually, for some context, when was this? This was in the context of the early 2000s. Singapore at that time was already one of the top five or six watch markets in the world. And if you think about it, you know, at the time the population was less than five million people. Um, and of course you could say, yeah, it's tourists, but actually it was a local population that was driving forward the watch market. Um, and that was so remarkable about it. So they said, uh, so my friend said to me, hey, um, uh, do you know anything about watches? And I said, are you kidding me? I, I, I love watches. My whole family loves watches. Uh, that's one of my favorite subjects. And he said, okay, let me stop you right there. I said, why are you stopping me? Uh, and he said, because um, as much as I love you, I also know that you're slightly full of shit. So um, I'm going to ask you to write a test so story on each of these subjects, and then I will tell you which one, uh, where, where in your aptitude lies. And I said, okay, that's great. A couple days later, and he was like, uh, so, uh, and already from the tone of his voice, I was a little disconcerted, and he was like, you know, so I read your story in sports, and you are possibly the most unathletic person I know. Um, you seem to know nothing about sports. And I was like, you know what, I accept that. Mm. Uh, and, uh, but then I was like, you know, with sort of a glimmer of hope, uh, how is my story on sex, right? And he's like, uh, how old are you, Wei? And I said, you know, early 30s. And he said, I 
think it's possible you've never actually had sex correctly. <laughs> and uh, I said, uh, oh, shit, are you sure? Should we get a second or third opinion on this? <laughs> and he said, actually, I've shown this story to every woman in the office, and they all think you're an idiot. I was like, oh, right, thanks. Mm. Um, so, you know, at this point, I was just kind of teetering on abject depression. Uh, and then he said, well, hang on, there's a silver lining. And I said, what? And he said, everyone like your story and watches, so you can be our watch writer. I said, fantastic. And then he, s he said, okay, pitch me a watch story. And uh, off the top of my head, I said, well, there's this um, uh, brand that used to be an Italian military tool, and it's now become a, a luxury watch brand. Uh, it's called Panerai. And he said, okay, I like this. Go write a story on this. Right? And that became um, the way I became a watch writer. How did, how did you have that idea? Well, to be fair, like I had always been kind of like interested in watches, okay. uh, and by that point, I was kind of you know I, this is back in the day of forums, and I used to like kind of um, go into forums and read the comments and learn about new things. So you didn't you didn't get this watch writing job from the magic of way making shit up. Like you actually knew what you're talking about. You were like in the scene. Well, I would say there was still some degree of making shit up. It was just that you know um, there was a, a there was certainly a spark of genuine passion, okay. which. W is also true in sex, but clearly so deep and profound is my incompetence that it didn't overcome that. Mm. And it's not true at all related to sports. I really don't care about sports mm. much. Well, I, I, I like exercising, and there are maybe a few sports that I like to watch, but mm. in general, like, you know, like. So then I became kind of like Singapore's uh, watch writer and uh, was representing um, the newspaper. And then, so, you know, then a lot of magazines started to kind of pick up on this and they started to hire me. And then they started to become the guy that did. Um, uh, supplements for all the major uh, publishing houses here, hmm. right? But it was frustrating because, again, like all publishing houses, um, which I understand, they're capitalists, they work on, on an equation, how little money can we spend to accrue the maximum amount of advertising revenue? Right? Sure. And back then it was all about advertising revenue, which mm. is, is very different now. Um, and uh, so never, no one would ever spend money on original photography, you know, like on, on cool design. They just wanted, you know, stories, right? Mm. Yeah. And uh, you know, more and more, I kept thinking about well, it's frustrating because I don't get to actually do what I like, to write the stories I like to do, do the type of photography I like to do. Um, and one day, my father saw me, and he's like, "What's going on?" I said, "You know, it's a little depressing. I mean, first of all, I write about watches, but I can't afford any of these watches, right? And second of all, I feel really limited by what um, I'm able to do in this profession uh, as a watch journalist." And he said, "Well, why don't you apply to INSEAD? Um, there's a campus here in Singapore now, right? So there's one in Fontainebleau, and there's there's one here." Um, and I said, okay, yeah, sure, why not, you know? Um, and in the process of this, my brother, uh, I think, had said, you know, they're gonna ask you during the oral exam phase, I don't know if this is actually true, he looks like fuck with me, right? Like, uh, what's a business that doesn't exist, but that should exist? And I said, well, I know. <coughs> I used the analogy of like um, a, a kid going to the cafeteria for the first time in an American high school, right? So the first table you see in that high school scenario is all the cool kids, right? Mm -hmm. And in the bookshop, the first shelf that you see is all the cool magazines. Mm -hmm. right, like lifestyle magazines. Then the next table in the cafeteria is the intelligent, um, but still socially viable kids, right? Um, and <laughs> in the magazine shop, you would see, you know, the, the next shelf would be like, you know, your Newsweek, your Time, your International Herald Tribune, the intelligent magazines, intelligent mm -hmm. lifestyle magazines. And then the table all the way at the end of the cafeteria, which is, you know, my table, of course, was the social outcast table where you have like all the kind of weird geeks and losers, right? And in the context of the bookshop or magazine rack, it would be the shelf all the way at the back on the bottom, which is where they would put the magazines on like um, cat fancy and model uh, train, um, like stamp collecting, all that, you know, I think there's a magazine on crochet called Beads and Buttons. Mm. And therein they would put uh, the um, magazines on watches, right? Mm. Um, so I was like, wow, this is really terrible because you're doing watches a huge disservice. And what someone should do is realign the position of watches as a lifestyle um, object, um, but without losing its technical credibility. So mm -hmm. my brother said, that's a great idea. You should make that magazine. And why not call it Revolution? So um, yeah, he, uh, he, he, he gave me the idea. I, uh, I started working on like a, a business model. I met uh, someone here who decided he wanted to invest in it. And then I was off and running with Revolution Magazine. So that's and how this started. was? So it uh, was kind of like all put together during 2004, mm -hmm. uh, and in 2005, the magazine was officially launched at the then Basel and uh, SIHH Salon International de Haute in, uh, in March in, uh, in, in Geneva. Wow. Yeah. And what was the reception like originally? So to be fair, like it, it probably, I probably you know, wouldn't do this today or I might be vilified for doing this, but I wanted to make it like an, a, a, a real provocation. Mm -hmm. 
And at the time, you have to understand that the way um, like sexuality was portrayed was very different from today. I think we're very self-censoring today. Mm. Except on social media where every single one wants to show pictures of themselves naked, strangely enough. Mm -hmm. um, check out my If I could, I would. Check out our, our OnlyFans pages. <laughs> yeah. <That's>, uh, <laughs> we don't have OnlyFans. Right? <laughs> Who the hell would go to our OnlyFans pages? <laughs> right? so I would anyway. say our mothers, but then that doesn't <laughs> that, sound right, really. That'd be terrible. <laughs> <laughs> So many Freudian <laughs> issues as a result of this. So, so I put a very attractive sort of woman on the cover without, you know, um, and in and, and sort of a very like, I guess almost a high fashion -y kind of like look, but then wearing the most complicated and cerebral watch I could think of, which was the Laga double split, mm. right? And people liked that somehow. And then they would open the magazine, they saw also really kind of like cool, daring, provocative lifestyle type shoots which if it was just that, it would have been facile and simplistic or superficial, but that was backed by really strong technical writing, but which wrote in a way that was fun and easy to understand, mm. right? And so that was the kind of formula for evolution was you got as much um, credibility as you would from like uh, Kronos or any of the most sort of like cerebral magazines, but you got it in a way that was fun and easy to understand. Plus you got this whole kind of visually rich dimension to it as well. Mm -hmm. And that actually, I guess, in the context of the watch industry was pretty revolutionary. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, and it did really well. Uh, we were profitable by, by our first issue. Uh, then we started this kind of global expanding process into all the different territories. And where was it selling? Uh, was selling very well here, was selling in the United States. We had um, uh, South American edition, Mexican edition, Italian edition, Spanish. At one point we had like the global, like the, this biggest, huge global footprint. I think we had the biggest um, footprint for any print publication for watches in the world. Right? Okay. And so each region was its own language too? And each region was its own language. Each region would take content from like the, the, the Singapore edition, which was like the HQ edition, and they would add and localize it as well. It's amazing, man. And, it, and I guess it segues into the rake pretty naturally, I suppose. Well, yeah, you know, like the, the rake came about because I couldn't find a men's magazine that I wanted to read, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I had loved uh, like GQ when uh, I had read it as a teenager in the 80s. You know, in fact, it, it, like you were smoking a cigar, I actually learned how to smoke a cigar from the pages of GQ. I mean, mm -hmm. it was really dedicated to like all things gentlemanly back in the day, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, uh, but as it had shifted into the 90s and into the 2000s, um, it had become, become more of a lifestyle magazine. Yep. yep. You know, so instead of like some cool guy on the cover that you would aspire to be like, you know, you would have, I don't, remember, I don't know if you remember like Jessica Simpson. Yeah, of course. Um, and as much as I feel Jessica Simpson is a very attractive young lady, she's not the man that I would aspire to be, mm -hmm. right? And the content sort of followed suit as well, just became kind of more generalist. Right? Yeah, yeah. And so I said, okay, that's a bit sad. And then the prevailing theme that was going on in fashion around then as well, right? So this is like, uh, I guess the mid 2000s is, uh, was that it was all about androgyny, like I guess we're coming out of the heroin chic era, but everyone had to be incredibly skinny um, you may re recall that uh, Eddie Sulman was a creative of course, director of yeah. the Om, yeah. and he made the world's um, skinniest suits, so yeah. much so that the only people that looked good in them were women or people that were actually on heroin. Yeah. Right? Uh, yeah. I, I believe Karl Lagerfeld had to famously lose like a third of his body weight to fit into them, which he did. Yeah. It's, oh man, I can't believe it was that long ago. Yes, now. exactly. So um, I said, well, this is sad because uh, I'm never going to have this body type. I, I actually went to Dior just to try on one of those suits. And I looked like a uh, Polish kielbasa sausage <laughs> that had been left on the grill for too long and was about to explode. Well, you right. know, that's the look now. Yes. Today. Yes. Today, that's the look. <laughs> clearly, yeah. clearly. So uh, um, I said, okay, that's a bit sad. And, and also, the last thing that really bothered me was in that period, um, there was all this social pressure for men to try to look young. Mm -hmm. Right, and I was, you know, t turning 40 pretty soon or thereabouts, um, and I said this is really sad because in every generation previous to ours, you know, um, men were considered to be cooler as they got older. Mm -hmm. Right, I mean that was the whole point of being a man. Right? Yeah, yeah. Which is the reality. You know, look, look how much cooler we are than our young versions of ourselves. Right. Um, yeah. You, you know, I'm, I can, I can, I can agree with that. I think it's just you become more comfortable with yourself and you stop giving a shit about what other people think. Yes. Right. Yes. Absolutely. Right. So, so uh, um, I was like, well, maybe I can create a magazine that brings back this whole idea of men getting better as they get older, right? Um, maybe I can portray older guys in it as well. Mm. I was like, look, fashion is so confusing right now. Let's mm. 
kind of go back to the classic codes, right? Because mm -hmm. I always loved education related to anything. So I would love to learn like uh, about like, for example, the history of black tie and then portray to people the I I idea that actually, well, a single breasted tuxedo is actually much more formal than a double breasted tuxedo. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's traditionally worn with a gilet or I guess a cummerbund if you must. And then coming from this sort of educated perspective, like then you could do whatever the fuck you want, right? Like you could be like Gianni Agnelli and rock out in like a denim tuxedo shirt or make yourself a linen, you know, midnight blue linen tuxedo uh, for the hot weather. But at least your choices are coming from an educated perspective, right? Because, yeah. you know, it's kind of like Picasso was a classic painter before he became, um, you know, a cubist, right? And, mm -hmm. I, and, and I think that that journey was probably uh, pretty quite, quite helpful to him. Um, so, and then the final thing was everyone was uh, communicating in emojis. And I was like, English is a lovely language. I love reading just really spirited um, uh, journalism um, from people who are masters of the, the pen. Mm -hmm. um, and so let's bring that back. And so to get people like Nick Fowkes to write for us and so on like that, where every sentence is just a, a work of art mm -hmm. and you're laughing at his use of, like, of, of, of grammar, you're laughing at his analogies and his metaphors, and it's fantastic, right? Yeah. So then, of course, I created um, the rake, put this all together, and it was a complete flop. I had launched it here in Singapore. And, was and it? I didn't realize. Yeah, I launched it here in Singapore. And, um, okay, now today it's very different. Singapore is, like, you know, full of people that love to dress up and wear suits and are tailor a tailoring enthusiasts and so on like that. Yeah. Everyone here, it, like, Singapore is like the new Brooklyn. Everyone here is, like, growing a single varietal coffee bean in their backyard. Yeah. Know? But back in the day, it, it wasn't like that. It was about mass fashion. Yeah. And, um, and tailoring was kind of dead here, actually. And so I remember a PR person had uh, picked up a copy of the magazine and said, I see that you've made a magazine about dead people in suits. And I was like, oh, <laughs> oh, oh, oh dear, no. this is not going well. Right? Oh, no. Uh, and I was pretty much saved by a guy named Jason Broderick, who was the head of menswear and watches um, at Harrods. Okay. And so he somehow found a copy of the magazine and he said, listen, I love this magazine. It's exactly what we believe in. It's uh, the complete ethos of, of what we represent. I want to buy you know, a few thousand copies of this and send it to all of our private shopping clients. And pretty soon, we were actually selling um, more copies to him than we were selling locally in Singapore. This was 2010, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, because I remember it coincided with the opening of the Armory pretty closely, too. Right. And we were excited to have it. I think we had copies of the rake oh, at cool. the shop when we first opened, too. Amazing. Because the early days of the rake were amazing. Like oh, It was just you. so exciting to have this magazine that was you know, like, I was a young guy, and I was like, this is a grown-up magazine. I'm reading a grown-up magazine And it's, now, it was, know? like, decidedly uh, and um, almost militantly, like, anti-fashion, right? It was yeah. exactly... But it wasn't as esoteric as a magazine like The Chap. Like, you still had to, you know, be mo contemporary, like, you know, in some ways, right? Yeah, you didn't need to own a pipe first to, to and, read and the magazine. And I can't grow a handlebar moustache, though, you know, mm. that's and, or mutton chops, so mm -hmm. that's just not possible for me. Um, yeah, so then uh, that sort of, like... Uh, precipitated a, a, a eventual shift to London as our, our base for the rake. Hey man, it's been quite a journey though, huh? Because you, when was the commerce part added to the rake? So to talk about that. That's the commerce for both of them um, was added, I, I would say about four years ago, right? I think that at that point, you know, digital had come up. Um, mm -hmm. Now, so at the time, everyone had thought digital was going to be a pathway to greater riches, mm -hmm. but it wasn't because um, advertising for digital was just very poor, right? Yeah. So and so um, and so the whole idea was okay. Then maybe the idea then is to have independence from advertising, right? Mm -hmm. And the only way to do that is to actually use your editorial ability to actually sell, mm -hmm. right? Yep. So I would say that um, we, and it, it was very interesting. So there's basically two experiments, one that happened with the rake and one that happened with the revolution, right? Mm -hmm. So the rake, we decided to go into selling clothing, mm -hmm. right? Um, and in the revolution, we decided to go into selling watches. Mm -hmm. And I would say the watch experiment was surprisingly extremely successful, mm -hmm. right? The clothing experiment, I would say, has had very mixed results. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, that having been said, we don't um, sell watches like uh, the way other e-commerce businesses do. We don't sell regular production watches. We yeah. decided to focus purely on limited edition stuff. Right? Yeah. And I think that that's, I mean, you know, there's different ways of doing it. That's, that's where my passion lies. Mm -hmm. You know, as a collector, that's what I would like to buy. Mm -hmm. And I find that invariably um, it's the thing that gets me excited, right? Because yeah. if I'm able to have the opportunity to design a watch that I ultimately like to buy, yeah. then the, and then the byproduct of that is people like it too, and they buy it as well. Yeah. 
that's the most rewarding thing in the world, right? And I get to write about it as well. I mean, and I get to yeah, you know, editorialize it or do a video about it. I mean, it's it's a great job, right? Yeah, it's. Um, I mean, you know, because. I love watches too. The army has just started to do a little bit of watches, but obviously clothing has really been our main thing. Right. And um, how's the e-commerce for the armory doing? E-commerce the armory is good. It is profitable, but it's because we're so niche and we're so small scale. Right. Um, that we don't get that many returns. Because right. you're right. Like the returns will totally kill you. Yes. Yeah. You know, and we design most of the stuff in house now too. So it's very much like a known quantity. Like a what we're selling, and b like when people buy it. Like they also know kind of what they're getting. Yes. So there's, there's like less, less kind of trial and error in our type of e-commerce. Yes. But you know, at the end of the day, like the armory, the brick and mortars, the primary part of the business. Right. No. Yeah. I, th I think that 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 is kind of what we are thinking about also related to the rake. I think it's much better to be specialized. Yeah. And be very very focused. And yeah. Actually, have much fewer brands and much fewer references, but just be really good at what you do. Right. Yeah. And so when we look at it, I think one of the mistakes that we made was we just grew too fast and we had too many different things. And it was a problem was I, I would go onto our website and be like, what is this? Like, I would never wear that, you know? Yeah. And I think the moment that happens, there's a problem. Right. And so we've had yeah. to kind of like, um, you know, basically kind of overhaul that. Yeah. Not I wouldn't say get rid of, but like you know, recognize that. There were a lot of brands that weren't the right fit for us as well. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, I agree with you. It's it's much better to be niche and extremely focused, right, and have a true expression of what the identity of the magazine is from the beginning. Right? Because on the design side, both on the clothing side and on the watch side, you're very involved with all of it. Yeah, you know, I I would say, uh, especially the watches. I would I would say with the clothing, certainly I'm involved with it. I mean, we sometimes we have guys that are just absolutely brilliant, like. Uh, Lorenzo Schifanelli, so I'm not going to get into his way, right? Yeah. You know, I, I mean, I go to him as a uh, bespoke tailor and seek his advice because I, I love what he does, yeah. right? Um, but uh, but yes, there'll be times as well. I mean, we've done um, our own line called the Rick Taylor Garments as well, mm -hmm. and that that is uh, um, something that I you know I help out with mm -hmm. from a design perspective. There was one moment, however, during COVID that we we um, realized that what I was thinking was completely wrong. Right, because I thought that people would be interested in a softer, fuller silhouette, mm. like kind of um, a more 1940s style mm -hmm. um, silhouette where, you know, uh, and actually people still like tight clothing for whatever reason. Mm. <laughs> like, I don't know why, but pe people still want their clothing tight, you know, or maybe they imagine that's what they want and then, the, and then <laughs> they get it, they're like, it's too tight, and then they return it, and you're like, dude. Yeah. You know? I th you know, it's funny you mention that because I, I feel the same way. I think it is coming. I've already transitioned to like fuller clothing. Yes. Partly because of my fuller body. <laughs> but, um, and this is one of the things, uh, one of the things that, that, it make that is much easier to do in the brick and mortar world, right? Yes. Like we have silhouettes that are definitely fuller than most other brands' silhouettes. Right. But we really believe in aesthetically why we do it that way. And all of our salespeople like all understand it and agree with this viewpoint too. And so when you're taking a customer through it in person, like you're putting your clothing on them, and you're on in the moment explaining to them why it's this way, yes. I think it's much easier to accept than if you just like had a package drop on your doorstep and you open it up. And they put and it on. It, yeah, like your expectations totally are mismatched with like Correct. your reality. Correct. You know? you know, a lot of times also like a fuller mm -hmm. silhouette is also a question of balance of like, say that, that you, it's weird to have like, a full jacket and then narrow trousers, for example, yeah. right? So like if someone buys like a jacket that's full cut and then he puts it on with like a pair of like, you know, like skinny jeans or whatever, like it's just gonna look very unbalanced, yeah. right? So you kind of need like, you're right, someone to walk him through that process as yeah. well, right? And, yeah. and, and, and kind of change their mentality related to clothes. Well, I hope that if anything else, we just get back to like, okay, in the way that you talk about um, 36.5 to 38 mm being a classic size watch. Yeah. I hope we also, and I agree with you, I hope we also get back to a, a point where people return to a classic size, fit, a classic fitted suit, right? Yeah. Which, which is, does not mean that it's clinging to you as if you've had it taped to your body. Yeah. Right? I think people will grow out of it. Though. I hope so. You know, because also, despite us being anti-fashion, right, like we still need stuff to change. Because like, otherwise you get bored. Absolutely. I don't think I could wear the same thing for more than say like five years, right? Yes. And then I need to like just change it up a little bit and, and go s try something new. Doesn't need to be massively different from what I had before, but it at least needs to be something different. I, I totally agree with you, and I think there's a constant evolution. Well, I think human beings by nature are, are, are evolving, right? Yeah. Um, but I think that also in terms of style, there's a constant evolution. And you know what's nice about it is 
the more it evolves, the more of a true expression it, it is of who you are. Absolutely. I think people never look good, no matter how beautifully dressed they are, if they're not comfortable, right? Mm -hmm. And I remember when I first launched, start, started the rake, I would go to events like Yuki Yomo dressed in a freaking like, you know, um, <laughs> everyone watches the Tom Thomas Crown Affair and then wants to wear like a, you know, uh, a single-breasted suit um, with a double-breasted gilet, right? You mm -hmm. know. Um, and then like even incorporate some of those details like a fishtail cuff, which looks ridiculous, right? <laughs> you know, or you know, like <laughs> or have brace top trousers where you know you've got or fish, you know, the, yeah. the split fishtail trousers as well. And it's like, you know, these are all things that are kind of cool if you're like a quirky dude that likes to dress up in front of the mirror. But like just wearing it into from day to day in, in, in terms of comfort, it's a little it's a little it's a little challenging. But anyway, back to the prevailing style. I would walk around in these outfits and I would feel like an imposter, right? Like I would feel like um, a guy who's playing dress up, you know, yeah. um, and so. Well, I, I, you know, I would give you more credit than that, though, because I, I think that you're one of these people who like has to try stuff, right? And yeah. you don't mind looking like a dumbass for the first couple of times. I don't because honestly, how do you know? Yes. Right. And a lot of people actually never even manage to breach that point. Yes. Right. They just stick to what they know. But at least you went and you like pushed the boat out and and just saw how did it work for you, right? I, I and think then you can analyze it properly. Yeah, I think also it's like I. Kind of like having a sense of humor about mm -hmm. clothing as well. For sure. Because I, I also feel there is no um, hobby that you truly enjoy if you take it so seriously that you're like basically a, a victim of it, right? Like mm -hmm. so, there's people, you know, and I guess Pete Diomo is a good example about it, who like are so um, wrapped up around how many times they're photographed and 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 how people will you know perceive their style mm -hmm. that they. I guess, and to some degree, are not even dressing for themselves anymore. They're dressing to appeal to someone else, right? Yeah. Um, and I, I think that that's a bit of a pity, you know. And I think mm -hmm. that that guys who look cool are the guys who just push it on and are just like, oh, I like this. It's fun, right? Let me go out there, you know. And and I yeah. like guys with a slightly wacky sense of style, yeah. and who have like clearly a bit of a sense of humor as well. Yeah. Right? You know. And you can always tell. Yes. Right. Because also, the, like you said, like it's always those guys who look the most natural. Yeah. Somehow. Yeah. Despite how crazy what they're yeah. wearing is. Yes. Somehow they've seen most. Yes, especially the Italian dudes are really good at this as well. Mm -hmm. You know, like I like so I think that the the guys who do Barbanera, uh, Sergio and Sebastiano yeah. Bardi are, are a very good example of this, right? I mean, okay, it helps that the two motherfuckers are like hands on the helm, right? Yeah. You know, you know, like. Yeah. Uh, um, but they have good taste too. But yes, they, they have, have good fantastic. Taste. I love taste. their taste. Yes, yeah. and exactly, and they look like they just roll out of bed, you know. Yeah. But somehow look like so immaculate and so cool, right? Yeah. And I and I, I really like that, you know. It's been quite a little segue from from your origin story, but I'm loving it. Yeah, but you know, I guess that's part of it as well. It's like so the you know the or origin set into motion um, two entities that I guess kind of took on a life of their own. Mm -hmm. I guess the rake today is cool also because it's a community, right? Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. like because I met a lot of people that I genuinely like as a result of the rake. I met you. I met um, Shari uh, Ahmed Shari Rahman. I met yeah. my friend Hani Farsi. I met uh, Paul Feig, you know, yeah. um, my editor Tom Chamberlain, who I consider to be a good friend, uh, is, is a result of, of The most English man in the world. He's the most English guy in the world. There's yeah. no one more English than him, <laughs> right? Um, and, and, <laughs> and I think he's very proud of that as well, <laughs> right? So, so the, um, the, the rake has given me this incredible kind of uh, community um, around the world and these amazing friendships, and I think that that's basically the most rewarding thing about the rake as well. Um, uh, Revolution is really interesting too because it has also reconnected me with this incredible world of watch collectors as well, mm. who are, I, I actually would probably say it's the community I love the most, mm. right? Because nothing to me is more fun than hanging out with a bunch of crazed watch nerds, mm -hmm. right? Like uh, it's, it's, because they like don't care about anything. You know, yeah. they're the least, they're the most democratic people in the world because they don't give a shit what color you are, yeah. what religion you are, what you look like, yeah. you know, um, all they care about is like, what are you wearing? <laughs> what, what are you talking, you know, wh how, how is that cool? What do you know about it? You know, and that yeah. kind of thing, right? You know? Yeah. So I think that that's, uh, it's something that I really love and I love about that community. Right? Yeah, I think that's a really beautiful way of putting what is so fun about watch collecting. Actually. But you're both, right? So you're, you're both a, a watch guy and also a style guy. Do you feel those things um, go hand in hand, or do you feel that they can occasionally be mutually exclusive? And I, you know, I'm surprised actually how many, like I, I met this guy um, recently, who we've actually become quite good friends, um, Phil Toledano, Mr. Enthusiast. He also has this brand called Viva Bastardo. Phil's gonna love it, the fact that I've talked about this brand <laughs> on TV. Uh, Phil has great taste in watches, right? right? Like he has Patek Beta 21s, he has like obscure Omegas, um, he's a big fan of like Rolex Kenmidas, 
And I was like, oh, Phil, you know, they did this this way because of the movement. And like, did you know this about them? And he's like, what? I'm like, you didn't know, like, how do you not know that? Like, if you are collecting at this level, right. how do you not know these things about the movement, right? right. He's like, I don't know, man, I just like them. I'm like, oh, damn, you're one of those people, right? Yes. And I was like, quite impressed, actually. But he's got taste. And yeah. you know, I, like, yeah. that's the thing. Like, yes. wow, then you must really have, like, just this great sense of, like, aesthetic and proportion right. to be able to appreciate these things even without appreciating the movement. Right. Because for me, like, I appreciate on both levels, yes. too. And I, I kind of almost need it. Yes. Um, but he can do it devoid of that, which I thought was was kind of wonderful. That's actually. cool. Yeah. I mean, I think I think it's cool that people come at these things from different angles. But mm -hmm. on some point, you know, that we do arrive at kind of a, a consensus about certain things. Like the King Midas is a really good one. Right? Yeah. But you know, like going back to like, are these two things mutually exclusive? Like, watch. You know what? We got a favor now. Watches are really expensive. Yes. And when I started collecting watches, watches weren't that expensive. Right. And now they're really expensive. You know. I think um, that definitely puts some people off, you yes. know, like, because there are some amazing clothing guys whose wardrobe are basically just thrifted, yes. right? And they just were super smart about how they put it all together, right? Yeah. And they have amazing wardrobe, but like, you can't really thrift a watch. No, you know? actually you're right. And, th and that actually makes it really accessible to the younger generation. So mm -hmm. if you look at like um, Nick Faust's sons, right? Yeah. Like their stuff is basically thrift stuff. Yeah. But they look immaculate, right? You know? Yeah, they do. Um, Absolutely. Whereas. Well, you know, that's another thing about watches, too, is that the barrier to entry is getting higher and higher, mm -hmm. right? Although there are some cool micro brands, like your Ferlon Maris and so on like that. Yeah. Well. You know right. what? I, I know Ferlon Mari, Dan Henry, these guys get flat because they're copying old designs, but they're, they serve they're not purpose. bad. No, I agree. They're not bad. You Baltic know? is amazing, you know? And yeah, Baltic's fantastic. That 36 millimeter, I bought one from you guys. No, I don't know if you know that, but I bought one. I'm into it. I think it's cool. It's worth three grand now. Is it? <laughs> Funny hell. Um, well, listen, man. Like, this was really great. Like, I really, really enjoyed, like, hearing the full origin story. I don't know why the hell we never had this conversation earlier, but I'm super glad we got to do it on camera. Um, I hope the viewers enjoy it as well. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to hear my origin story, but if they do, let's, like, cut this and, and move it on to another section. Perfect. Wei, thank you so, so much. Um, it has been such a pleasure to spend time with you in Singapore. Thank you for having me at the Revolution TV studios. Thanks for letting me smoke in here because <laughs> I cannot pleasure. find anywhere in Singapore to smoke, which kills me. <laughs> um, and uh, I will miss you, man. I'm leaving Hong Kong tomorrow. I really miss you. Dude, I'm going to miss you as well. But, uh, you know, I, I'm sure we, our paths will cross multiple times in the future. And if not, um, I'll keep in touch with you through your OnlyFans page. Oh, thanks, man. Thanks. thanks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good to see you, brother. <laughs> <laughs>